Hello, brothers and sisters. Welcome back. Today in our study, we're going to be in phase two of the wrath of the Lord of hosts. And it is called the battle of the great day of God Almighty, right? The day, it begins with the day of Christ at Jesus' second coming. Hallelujah. On the last day of this age. But the battle of the great day of God Almighty is not just something that's going to occur one evening. This is going to last for many days. It is the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Now, in this study concerning phase two of the day of the Lord, the battle of the great day of God Almighty, commencing with the arrival of the commander of the Lord's army, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Lord God Jesus, uh, King of kings and Lord of lords. This short study, we're going to look specifically at... What is meant by a sword, not of man, that you see in Isaiah 31, and we're going to look at, um, which is the same thing, a stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands in Daniel 2. So Daniel 2 and Isaiah 31 is talking about the day of Christ when he begins chasing that fleeing serpent, right, Leviathan. The Antichrist, who is possessed by Satan. So I've got some pretty cool verses here for you. Some passages in the Bible that just bring it all together. It's really neat how Jesus has always said that he has told us all things beforehand. Right? Matthew 24, 25 and Mark 13, 23. And he surely has. We even see verses about what's going to happen to the Antichrist. Where is he going to be when Jesus appears? Um, we know that he's going to die some, somewhere between the north side of the Mount of Olives at, a, at an old ancient town in Israel called Nob, N-O-B. We see that from Isaiah 30, uh, Isaiah 10.32. And somewhere between there and Mosul, Al-Mazel, Iraq, he will meet his fate. And it could be during the worst earthquake of all time that we read about in Revelation 16, verses 17 through 21. And that has to do with Jesus stepping, standing onto the Mount of Olives and splitting it in half. So let's get right into this. The sword not of man, which is also a stone cut out of the mountain without hands, right? God's doing. What does God tell us in advance, thousands, thousands of years in advance? What does the Lord tell us is going to happen at the end of this war on Israel? Now, remember the 70th week of Daniel, that missing last seven years that the Bible says that will occur prior to this um, current age coming to an end and father starting a new age with the millennial reign of his son and his law shall go forth from Jerusalem. Hallelujah. So, yeah, and, and the war on Israel's when it begins during the last seven years of the age, now we're down to under three years before Jesus comes, says Isaiah chapter 16. And Jesus renders the country of Jordan's uh, punishment. So the wrath of the Lord of hosts has many titles. Uh, we know it best as the wrath of God or the wrath to come or the day of the Lord of hosts. But and his wrath does come with two phases. But when this war begins, this last seven years of the age will be down to under less than three years. And then Jesus will appear on the last day at the blowing of the last trumpet. And he will begin, commence phase two of the war on Israel, which the word of God calls the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Right? It's more, much more than just those nations gathered in the valley of Armageddon. This whole area between the brook of Egypt and the, on the Gaza-Sinai border, all the way up to the Euphrates River Basin, up into Mosul and Baghdad, this whole region is going to be threshed personally by Jesus. And then areas and his armies and his weapons of indignation, right, which include angelic forces, uh, his um, brand new transfigured family as well as the my mighty ones who come out of the far north that he calls for at the seventh trumpet in Isaiah 13 and Jeremiah chapters 47 through 51 
Hallelujah. Yes, all of Jesus' weapons of indignation will be used during this battle of the great day of God Almighty that commences uh, on the last day of this age and starts phase two of the wrath of God. So let's get right into this. This is a short study that I have created for you and I ha am getting ready to upload it. By the time you see this, it should have already been uploaded to the folks at keepandshare.com, the cloud where I keep all of my 70th week of Daniel short studies. I have about 700 that I've uh, up created and uploaded to that cloud, my share page, my 70th week of Daniel folder. Everything's free. Um, they print out really nicely uh, if you take them to Staples for about 70 cents a sheet in color, 11 by 17 landscape. Um, so yeah, you can get like, what, six for, uh, you know, around $4. Um, so you know, I don't make any money off of it, but they're really nice to have blown up into 11 by 17. Everything's real crystal clear. All right, here we go. His severe sword. What in the world is that? Well, I get that from Isaiah 27. His severe sword, not of man, without human means, without hands. I actually call this short study uh, a, a sword and stone, not of man. That's, that's the title I gave it. So this is all about the seventh bowl return of Jesus and the battle of the great day of God Almighty. The Assyrian serpent named Gog will have his grave dug by Jesus, or you could say the Lord of hosts, as he flees away from the Mount of Olives, the area of Nob, N-O-B. You read about Nob in Isaiah 10, verse 32. It's the area just north of the Mount of Olives, which is really interesting because when Jesus comes back, that's one of the first things he's going to do is help the inhabitants of Jerusalem who have been under siege escape 2.5 miles east to Bethany, right? We read about that in Zechariah 14. But Nob in Isaiah 10 is just north of the northern slope of the Mount of Olives. And uh, that's where he's going to be when Jesus appears, the Antichrist. I call him the Assyrian because the Bible calls, calls him the Assyrian. Did you know that? He is called the Assyrian in many places, like Micah 5.5, 5, uh, Isaiah 14.25, Hosea 11.5, Isaiah 10, uh, Nahum 1.11 says he'll actually come forth at the first seal on the white horse from al Mazil, Iraq. We know it is Mosul, Mazil, Magog, hallelujah. Not Russia. Not the country of Georgia, not Azerbaijan, Armenia, but actually from al Mazil, Iraq. When that peace treaty is signed with Israel called the covenant with death that results in the shadow of death for the nation of Israel. Um, it'll be, he will come forth when it's signed. It may or may not be signed in Mosul, but he will come forth at that time going out conquering and to conquer. Hallelujah. So the Assyrian serpent named Gog, right? We get Gog from Ezekiel 38, will have his grave dug by Jesus as he flees away from the Mount of Olives, Olives area of Nob, and his princes who escape judgment will become forced labor, right? People from Assyria don't like to hear that. People from Babylonia, Baghdad area, they don't like to hear that. A lot of Muslims don't like to hear that, but that's what the God of heaven the Most High God, the God of the universe, has already declared, right? And uh, where is that in the Word? Well, let's take a look at it. So Isaiah 27, verse 1 is the first passage I have for you. In that day, the Lord, with his severe sword, great and strong, will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, that twisted serpent, and he, the God of uh, heaven, uh, the Lord of hosts, will slay the reptile that is in the sea. Now, some of these references about the sea or the beast that comes up out of the sea in, in Revelation has to do with the eastern Mediterranean Sea. Did you know that? And you might say, well, how do you know that? Well, first of all, a huge gas... Uh, field find has been found a few years back 
I think it's probably eight or nine years ago, it was found right off the coast of Israel, and they named it Leviathan. And now all of the countries in the eastern Mediterranean region, even Russia is getting involved. That's why Russia has uh, built a base there in Latakia, Syria, right on the eastern Mediterranean Sea coastline because it uh and that's why they've been so aggressive in the black sea and bosphor strait is because it, the world wants it's to own these gas fields these pockets of gas that are found under the eastern mediterranean sea this is the leviathan that comes up out of the sea and will cause kings to make alliances with each other from the north from the south and uh and we see it coming coming alive here in our day. But we shouldn't be so surprised here in 2021 that these things are happening in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. It should be of no surprise to us who watch and know what to watch for. Why? Because the Lord told you, the one who who's your beloved, who loves you enough to die for you, has told you that he's foretold you all things beforehand. You just got to look. He told you in Hosea 6, verses 1 through 3, that he's coming back after two days. That's what it says, Hosea 6, 1 through 3. Read it. And it has to do with the two days of labor in Father's Vineyard, right? That you read in Matthew 20. And don't forget Luke uh, 10. The Lord showed us in the parable of the Good Samaritan that he gave the innkeeper exactly two denarii right the value of two days of in father's uh, vineyard two days of labor in father's vineyard that's exact amount that the amount that he gave the innkeeper and said this should do till i come back if not i'll pay you more so look those passages up the parable of the uh laborers in the vineyard in matthew 20 and look up the uh, parable of the good samaritan in luke 10 and now you know what's meant by hosea 6 and there's other prophecies that point towards the very near future right prophecies found in isaiah 7 the first prophecy in isaiah 7 the one about within 65 years right but the bible doesn't give us a start date for that uh, but it could be 1967 is that right 68 um we'll see within 65 years ephraim shall be broken that it shall not be a people uh, that's talking about phase one of the coming war on Israel. The wrath of the face of him who sits on the throne, the time of Jacob's trouble. So there's lots of scriptures that are pointing to uh, the very near future of our Lord's return. But it's not imminent because he does not come until the last day. All right. He doesn't. We wish he came sooner, but he tells us in many passages like Zephaniah 3 8 that we must wait on him until the day he rises up to take plunder that's not talking about the phase one plundering of his own people right which he will orchestrate but it's about when Jesus will lead the family of God and plunder those who plundered Israel right that's what that's talking about so we are to wait on our Lord until his seventh bowl appearing in glory that's the day of your blessed hope the day you get your unspeakable joy, your, your uh, linen dressed in white, your crown of righteousness, right? When you are mustered to the armies of the Lord of uh, Ezekiel 37 and Revelation 19. So we must wait. Father is going to use us and put us to work during the last seven years of the age. And we will give good counsel to the earth. And we will manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God. So, uh, the severe sword. The severe sword is the same thing as the stone count cut out of the mountain without hands. But Isaiah 27 is where you want to go if you want to read about his severe sword, great and strong. The one that will punish Leviathan, that fleeing serpent. Pay attention to fleeing. Because when you get to Isaiah 31 and some other passages like Isaiah 17, and you read about how... Um, those who are besieging Jerusalem, those who have taken one third of Israel, mainly their young people, into captivity. Um, now Jesus is going to have his vengeance 
and he's going to lead many forces, all of his weapons of indignation, right? Isaiah 13, 15, and Jeremiah 50, 25. Um, the Lord's going to lead them into battle. And, and all of Gog's forces, to include Gog himself, will be backpedaling as fast as they can away from the Mount of Olives when Jesus comes off of that cherub of Ezekiel chapter 1 and stands on the Mount of Olives. <clears throat> and the banner is lifted up into the air, a war banner. And Gog is heading north. He wants to get away from that mountain as fast as he can. Now, I don't know exactly where the Lord of hosts will dig um, Gog's grave, the man possessed by Satan. And Satan is running as fast as he can, too. Yes, he's possessing Gog of Magog, the man of sin. But... Um, and the, uh, the Satan wants to get away too in the spiritual realm because he knows he's about to be placed in handcuffs for a thousand years. <clears throat> so somewhere between the northern side of the Mount of Olives, somewhere between there and Mosul, um, Gog of Magog will be killed and he by the Lord and, and the Lord will dig his grave for him, <clears throat> probably using earthquakes. And then after he's been buried, um, he will be, the earth will shake and he will be cast back out of his grave like an abominable branch so that the world who escapes judgment and permitted to live and enter Jesus's kingdom in their mortal bodies, which does happen, if you don't believe me, see Isaiah 66 verses 18 through 21, and these people left alive that will be ruled over by Jesus um, will we'll see the body of Gog and, and look at it and think this puny, disgusting uh, bag of bowels is the one that, that brought the world to its knees. Of course, we know why. is because Father allowed Satan to give him his power, right? And so that father could test the world, just like father warns he's going to do in Revelation 3.10. So uh, Leviathan, that twisted serpent, and he, the Lord, will slay the reptile that is in the sea. Now let's go to Isaiah 31, verses 8 and 9. Again, this remember what the subject is here. The subject isn't just about the battle of the great day of God Almighty, uh, starting at the seventh bowl into the early days and weeks of the millennium but the subject is about the sword and the stone right that's that's made without a hand human hands so isaiah 31 8 the when then assyria shall fall by a sword not of man and we read about that in jeremiah 15 51 and isaiah 13 and 14 then Assyria shall fall by a sword, not of man. Again, again, that sword it is referencing is the one that the whole chapter was devoted to it four chapters earlier, right? Isaiah 31 is referencing that sword of Isaiah 27. A sword not of man and a sword not of mankind. In other words, picture father coming. No one can see him. But you see Jesus sitting to the right hand of the power on this cherub of Ezekiel 1. But who is in the right hand of Father? His son, Jesus. And who's in the right hand of Jesus? We are. Hallelujah. His beloved. Um, so, then Assyria shall fall by a sword not of man, and a sword not of mankind shall devour him. But he shall flee. There's that same fleeing going on when Jesus shows up that you see four chapters earlier in Isaiah 27. But he, Gog of Magog, right, the Antichrist, shall flee from the sword and his young men shall become forced labor. So that's where I get that from, right? Those who, young, young men, those who don't have the mark of the beast shall become a possession of Israel and they will be forced to labor. Um, he shall cross over to his stronghold. This he is really, it would be small h if it wasn't the first letter of the sentence. 
Um, this is the Antichrist. He shall cross over to his stronghold for fear. In other words, he's hightailing it. Now, the question is, where is the stronghold? Is the stronghold the forward operating base at Nob, Israel? That's mentioned in Isaiah 10, verse 32. Or is it Mosul or Baghdad? Well, because of what I read in Daniel, in Nahum, excuse me, 114... That's where you get the I will dig his grave, right? Nahum 1.14, all about the, uh, uh, the appearing of Jesus to destroy the uh, wicked, vile counselor of Nahum 1.11. Uh, and, and Nahum 1 even says there'll be no more Antichrist after this one to ever, ever, ever pass through Israel again because Israel will dwell safely during the millennium. And we'll read more about that when we get to the bottom of the short study. So then Assyria shall fall by a sword not of man, and a sword not of mankind shall devour him. He shall flee from the sword, and his young men shall become forced labor. He shall cross over to his stronghold for fear. Now that crossover could be crossing from south to north, crossing over top of the Mount of Olives, just as Jesus is appearing. Or it could be crossing over the Jordan in route to Mosul maybe passing through the, the Golan Heights. Um, and, and on the subject of the Golan Heights, don't forget there are um, 10 dormant volcanoes all within the Golan Heights. And this earth is going to be, the earthquake will be the worst earthquake in human history, at least in that region, says Revelation 16, verses 17 through 21. So that could be where the lake of fire is, right there in of the eastern uh, uh, Jezreel Valley, or you can call it the Golan Heights. Maybe that's where he'll meet his fate. And his princes shall be afraid of the banner, says the Lord, whose fire is in Zion and whose furnace is in Jerusalem. Hallelujah. All right, Daniel 8, 23 through 25. And remember, Daniel 8, 23 through 25 is where you get the understanding Gabriel gave Daniel in regards to the prophecy called 2,300 days, right? The length of the vision with verse 23 being the start event of the 2,300 day countdown, which is the first seal arising of the Antichrist in Mosul, riding a white horse and going out conquering and to conquer. That's verse 23 and 25 is the appearing of Jesus Christ. Right at the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So let's read 23 through 25 in regards to the 2300 day countdown of Daniel 8. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, a king shall arise, having fierce features who understand sinister schemes. Right? This is the vile one of Daniel 11, 21. And then, of course, it is the Antichrist of Nahum 1, 11. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. We know what that means. That means he is given power by Satan, and Father authorizes it. And you can read about that in Revelation 13, verses 5 through 15. And he, the Antichrist, shall destroy fearfully, and shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty... Right? That means the nations with great militaries and also the holy people, Israel, through his cunning. Now, you might say, well, surely Israel doesn't get destroyed in, during the last seven years of the age. Oh, but they do. The Bible says they do. I know there's some verses that talk about when the, the Antichrist passes through Israel. That's when the Lord will rise up against him. Yes, that's true, but the Lord doesn't rise up against him until um, Israel acknowledges their offense. And we've had, and Father says he's going to execute judgments on Israel in the midst of the nations who have gathered against her. In other words, Israel's sins, iniquities, and transgressions must be covered, and they're going to be covered by their own suffering, and two-thirds of them shall be purged from the land of the living, says Zechariah 13, verses 7 through 9. This will be uh, an event that 
uh, will cover the sins of Israel and it will serve because they didn't push the easy button and use Jesus's blood atonement. They will have to pay um, this way. And you might say, well, their suffering um, won't get them eternal life. And you're right. We're not talking about them being transfigured. We're talking about them entering the kingdom of Jesus, their Messiah, in their mortal bodies. But the Lord can't even do that until Israel has been purged and their sins taken away before Jesus can even dwell in their midst. I hope you understand what I'm saying. So he, the Antichrist, shall destroy full fearfully and shall prosper and thrive. See how he's going to destroy Israel and the mighty. He's going to do it by invoking fear, right? Do what I say or I'm going to cut your child's head off in front of you. I mean, it's that kind of fear. So that's why the Lord lets us know in his word that in Isaiah 31 verse 9 that you see, uh, on this short study, he, the Antichrist, shall cross over to his stronghold for fear. In other words, Jesus and, and his father are going to play with their prey. Right When Jesus comes back like a roaring lion, he wants the evil people that belong to Gog, the Assyrian, to suffer fear, terror, and shame for a, a period of time. And of course, some will actually be taken into forced labor, right? Become a possession of Israel. Uh, but just as they are rendering fear to people on earth, especially Israel and Christians, uh, when it's his turn for punishment, their turn for punishment, right? At phase two of the day of the Lord, the battle of the great day of God Almighty, beginning with the, the day of Christ, when he invokes the wrath of the Lamb, uh, yeah, it'll be his turn to, to suffer fear. What goes around comes around. So verse 25 of Daniel 8, this is the um, end event of the 2300 day countdown of Daniel 8. Verse 25, through his cunning, he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule and he shall exalt himself in his heart. He shall destroy many in their prosperity, right? That's Revelation talks about their luxuries in their prosperity. In other words, people are not going to want to give up free Wi-Fi. They're not going to want to give up free gas for life using gas-powered cars. I'm just using that as an example, right? People will not want to, uh, they'll want to take the mark of the beast, right? So they can live in this wonderful kingdom of this man, this Assyrian, who says he's God and begins working miracles and his false prophets working miracles and the image shall speak and deceive if possible even the elect. It's going to be sorcery, says Revelation 18, 23. And the world will be like, that's what I, that's all I needed to see. He He's going to treat me that good and he shows that he's God, which he's not. But he's showing that, putting it on display. And unless people know their Bibles, they're going to believe it. But those who honor the word of God and have taught their children and their children's taught their children. And you have this family, right? These households um, teaching every generation, their family to honor the word of God. And then the fruit of it will be that the last generation who actually has to go through this mark of the beast test will be ready. Right? Because their moms, dads, grandmas, grandpas, great grandmas, great grandpas warn them, whatever you do, wait on the Lord until he comes and do not worship the Assyrian. Don't take the mark of the beast. Even if it means you and your child's life, you don't do it. Hallelujah. And the word of God is so precious. But yet we let it collect dust, all 10 copies, and we throw it in a drawer somewhere and it never gets read. And it is truly the way to life. Um, so, continuing on with verse 25 of Daniel 8, this is the end event to the 2300 day countdown that shall be shortened a little bit for the sake of the elect, right? Matthew 24, 22. He, the Antichrist, shall even rise against the Prince of Princes, capital P Prince, that's Jesus, 
right, that you read about in Revelation 19. But he, the Antichrist, shall be broken without human means. There you go. That's pointing you to Daniel 2, verse 44. It's also pointing you to Isaiah 27 and Isaiah 31, right? All these passages we have here on this short study, they all go together. It all fits nicely. Uh, broken without human means. That means the God of heaven, the most high God, Yah, the Holy One of Israel, is going to orchestrate all of this. Uh, Daniel 2. Oh, but anyways, don't forget about Daniel 8. That's the 2300-day countdown that uh, you read about, starting with verse 23. How about that? The Lord makes it easy to remember. Right from the first seal to the seventh bowl is scheduled for 2,300 days. But we're told in Matthew that that's going to have to be shortened for the sake of the elector. There'd be no one left undergoing the siege of Jerusalem, right? Not to mention others around the world. There'd be no one left alive. Now, Daniel 2, verses 44 through 45. This is really the first place in the book of Daniel where you start reading about this stuff, this last final battle during this age. It really gets fought during the early days of the millennium. Daniel 2.44, And in the days of these kings, that's the kings of Daniel 7.24 and Daniel 2, verses 40 through 43, just before this verse 44. Talking about the ten kings. And in the days of these kings... In other words, the ten kings of the fourth kingdom in Persia. The ten kings of the fourth kingdom in Persia. That's what we're talking about. The fourth kingdom. And in, days, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven, the Lord of hosts, will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Right? That never be destroyed is also what uh, Nahum 1.15 is talking about. There will be no more Antichrist to ever pass through Israel again during once the Lord of hosts sets up this kingdom, this kingdom of God, this kingdom of heaven. And the king, and it's going to be here on earth. Don't think this is in the third heaven or in the spiritual realm or dimension. No, it's going to be on, on planet earth. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all of these kingdoms. Now, when it says these kingdoms, it's talking about uh, the first three kingdoms in Persia, beginning with Nebuchadnezzar. All these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever, insomuch as you saw the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, right? This is Daniel 2, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, right? The statue, the, the statue of Daniel 2, the great God has made known to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. So this dream was uh, not only covering what would happen in a few centuries after King Nebuchadnezzar, but all the way up until 2021, 2025, 2030, whenever the Lord comes back. Okay, whenever we see this fourth kingdom in Persia begin to take shape with these ten kings. Yeah, right? So, um, yeah, the great God has made no, known to the king what will come to pass after this the dream is certain and its interpretation is true now to finish this short study let's go to hosea 11 that's one book of the bible that most christians from what i can tell don't spend enough time in the 14 chapters of hosea which is all about the last days and i think if more people understood that they would pick up hosea a little bit more often all right, starting uh, two verses, Hosea eleven ten through 11. They shall walk after the Lord. He will roar like a lion when he roars. Then his sons, it doesn't say brethren, his sons. So this is father, the Lord of hosts. When, when he roars, then his sons shall come trembling from the west. 
They shall come trembling like a bird from Egypt and like a dove from the land of Assyria, and I will let them dwell in their houses, says the Lord. These two verses of Hosea 11 is talking about Isaiah um, 11. Isn't that cool? This is talking about Isaiah 11. This is when the Lord sets his hand a second time to recover the remnant. Right? That one third of Israel that Zechariah 13 talks about that will be freed and delivered by Jesus and all of his weapons of indignation. And Jesus will lead them back to Jerusalem. And then the command goes out to the nations, bring me my people and you treat them like a king and a queen. Right? And then when you get here, oh, by the way, some of you, depending on which nation you are, I'm going to have you become a possession for my people. And we can either do this the easy way or I can send my angels out and we can do it the hard way. And after they see God appear in the sky, then they realize that Gog of Magog was a phony possessed by the devil. And the, rear, the real God truly is the God of Israel. And the whole world will know it and they will listen. And re also remember the Satan will be put in handcuffs and he won't be able to tempt these nations. Then like he tempts them now and they will act right in their right mind. So yeah, Isaiah 11 is Hosea 11. They shall walk after the Lord. He will roar like a lion when he roars. Then his sons shall come trembling from the west. They shall come trembling like a bird from Egypt, like a dove from the land of Assyria. And I will let them dwell in their houses, says the Lord. Now to end this short study, let's break this down. This Hosea 11, let's break it down. So when it says like a bird, like a dove, coming from these, these territories, it's talking about coming back from slavery, set free. But I want you to pay attention to Isaiah 60, verse 8. Go read Isaiah 60, verse 8. When the question is asked, who are these that come back to their roost flying like a dove, right? It's talking about the same thing as it is here in Hosea 11 and really Isaiah, uh, Hosea 11 and Isaiah 11. That's what Isaiah 60 is talking about, verse 8. So, years ago, I used to get a little confused and wonder if Hosea 11 was talking about um, transfigured uh, family members who shall live in Jesus' kingdom and stand upright and dwell in his midst. Uh, but no, this is talking about uh, mortal Israel coming back from slavery and them being brought by air. Which makes sense. So I guess not all the airports in the world is completely destroyed. They're obviously going to have to put a lot of work into Tel Aviv. Remember, this isn't going to happen the first night that Jesus appears and tramples the wine press. This is going to take some time for, for the Lord to uh, complete this setting his hand a second time to recover the remnant. In other words, we got to bring in the bulldozers. we got to clean up the mess. It's going to take seven years really to get rid of this mess says Ezekiel 39 and we're going to have to rebuild Tel Aviv and then the nations are going to start flying in like a dove like a bird to their roost Jerusalem bringing uh, Israelis not just from the nations that took them into captivity but no matter where they're at on the planet they will come to Jesus and dwell there it will be an order from Almighty God himself and there may be people who didn't even know they're of the seed line of Jacob. That's interesting. I, I don't know what to say about that because the, the Bible is kind of quiet about that. But will there be DNA tests? I don't know. Where you can find out whether you're from the seed line of Jacob or not. I don't know. Um that's uh, Isaiah 60 verse 8. Now, dwell in their houses. Let's deal with that real quick. You need to understand that all of these passages that I have here for you in the yellow box, Zechariah 14, Ezekiel 38, Ezekiel 34, Jeremiah 33, Jeremiah 32, Jeremiah 23, Proverbs 1, that's all talking about the millennium when Jesus shall dwell in the midst of Israel and they shall dwell safely, finally, 
and they will dwell safely forevermore, even in eternity after the millennium. And there are some people that don't believe that the dwell safely of Ezekiel 38, 8 through 14 is talking about the millennium. But when you look at all of these verses I've laid out for you and match that up with Hosea 11, you see, yes, Ezekiel 38, 8 through 14 is talking about the millennium. You have to be careful with Ezekiel 38 and you have to divide Ezekiel 38 up into three parts. Verses 1 through 8a is uh, um, talking about the 70th week of Daniel, premillennium. Verses 8b through 16 of Ezekiel 38 is talking about post-millennium when Satan is let loose from prison for a short time to, to stir up trouble again. And then verses 16b through the end of the chapter of Ezekiel 38 is all about pre-millennium again. In other words, the end of the 70th week. So you have to divide Ezekiel 38 up like that. And when you do that, 8b through 14 dwells safely is talking about during the millennium. I hope that made sense to at least some of you. Uh, let's finish with um, going back to the middle of this short study, Daniel 8, verse 25, when it says, And he shall exalt himself in his heart, talking about the Antichrist, in the red box, I have some verses that are talking about the same event, right? The abomination of desolation and the fifth seal exalting himself as, as God. Isaiah 10, 15, Daniel 8, 11, and 25, Daniel 11, 36, and 2 Thessalonians 2, 4 all talk about this fifth seal abomination of desolation event when God gets possessed by Satan, starts the 42 months period, and begins, yeah, exalting himself as high as the God of heaven. Well, brothers and sisters, let's go ahead and end this short study. I, I hope this has been a blessing to you. I don't get enough feedback letting me know whether you liked it or didn't like it, or you learned something you didn't know, or if you think I made a mistake, let me hear about it. Hallelujah. And I hope you like all of these matching Bible references. So that's it. His severe sword, the, uh, th this sword that's not of man, this stone that's cut out, of the mountain without hands, uh, without human means. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope it's all coming together for you. And if you have any questions, please ask. And until I see you again, God bless.